Peace be with you, and welcome to the Word in the Middle of the Week. For August 23rd, Wednesday, uh, we are looking at the service of Matins. We are learning how the Church's tradition of morning prayer shapes our own piety, shapes our own practice of the faith. People, you know, we've, we've come through many decades of sort of questioning in the Lutheran Church and within the Church generally, people wondering, I'm going to turn out a light here, people wondering, you know, should the, should the Church be as it is? Is there a better way the Church can be? And that's a question that is worth asking uh, to an extent. That is, it's worth always asking, not so much should the Church be differently than it is, but is the Church being what it's called to be? That's really the question to ask. And in the last several decades, people have frequently pitted sort of personal piety over against social action or um, sort of moral character over against doctrinal commitment. And often what they'll do is they'll privilege social action and moral character over doctrinal commitment and personal piety. But of course, our Lord Jesus doesn't do that. And that should come as no surprise to us because our Lord has come to make things whole. And the way he makes things whole is by giving us all good things. And certainly the church is called to behave justly within the world and also called to have good moral character. But neither of those works one, first of all, none of those work without the other. Sometimes people will even pit sort of social action over against moral character and say, well, your personal morality is one thing, but really what matters is how you behave in society and how you treat your neighbor. And yet what we find is that if there's no moral core, um, how we treat our neighbor and act in society can, will, will ultimately erode from the inside and will be affected by that. Now, when I say moral core, within, within the Christian church, we have a particular understanding of what that is. At the heart of it is repentance. At the heart of it is not necessarily always being, um, well, it's, it's acknowledging that we will, not, we will not always be the most morally upright people we should be, but there is repentance before God. There can be forgiveness and repentance. And that act and experience of repenting before God and receiving his forgiveness is what ultimately is shaping our moral core and our moral vision of life, which will then be marked by compassion, kindness, patience, generosity, self-control towards other people. And so our moral core shapes our social action, but our moral core then also is shaped by this experience of repentance and forgiveness. And for that to happen, there must be a, a true doctrinal commitment as well as a personal piety. And so it all works together because, of course, God has come to redeem the whole person. And we see that in our Lord's comment, his answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment? He says, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, right? Soul, heart, mind, strength. I mean, the three, the three, four things we just talked about, doctrinal commitment, personal piety, moral uh, character, and social action. It's all caught up in that, uh, in a way. You could sort of assign it that way. But um, he comes to redeem the whole person. He comes to raise the dead. And therefore, he comes to give us all good things and not privilege some of that over the other. So when we are studying something like the Matin service, a liturgical service of the church that perhaps the majority of the world pays no attention to, and we ask, how does that shape our personal piety? This is not a matter of our arcane, sort of esoteric, private interest. It's more and more I hear that, the sort of concession to religion these days seems to be, well, that's fine if it gives you comfort, right? Oh, look, folks, it's not just all about comfort. And I've talked about this before. Sometimes the faith makes you uncomfortable. Sometimes being a believer is very discomfort. Uh, discomforting, discomfitting, because uh, you are not always comfortable with the world when you're a believer, right? 
and you're not always comfortable with yourself and you're not always comfortable with God. I mean, there's, there's a lot of discomfort that can come with being a believer because what's happening in the faith is we are being made new and a new kingdom is pressing into the world and a new creation has been formed in the resurrection of Christ and on and on we could go. Uh, but, so this idea that, well, it's there to give you comfort. There may be some who believe that and some who treat it that way, but that is not what it is about. Uh, this is of the essence of the good life. If we are to know the good, ultimately we must know Christ. We cannot know the good without knowing Christ. We cannot know the good without loving Christ and receiving Christ and all of his gifts. And so to study something like Matins, to talk about personal piety, is to be engaged in, in warfare against the devil, is to be engaged in the great social reform of the world that began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues to this day. It is to be engaged with the grand task of confessing Christ before others, that he may confess us before his Father in heaven. Uh, this is one of the most important things. What, what we're doing in this live stream on Facebook is one of the most important things happening in Wausau right now. And we can't overstate that. People don't think it is. Again, well, it's nice because you comfort. Well, they, something they do is like a hobby. Mm -mm. You know, schools are beginning, beginning starting today for some parochial schools and then into the next week for all the rest. Um, people are going to work. Uh, marriages are being formed. Divorces are being accomplished. Business deals are being forged and broken. Uh, people are making life and death decisions. And we may be tempted to say, well, that's so much more important than what you're doing there. This is one of the most important things because this informs all of that. This gives us the strength for that. This helps us understand why all of that is. This gives us, gives us hope to engage it. Um, the most important thing you can have, a fellow pastor often says, is a good church. The most important thing you can have is a good church. And if you are in a place where there is not a good church, then either move to where there is one or start one. It's because the you know change in other words change your life so as to have a good church, change your life so as to have a good church, and um, because that's the most important thing. And whatever it requires of you, so be it. And a good what is a good church? Well, one thing a good church does is a good church listens. And we, we have to be just unapologetic about this. A good church listens to the church of the past. The church, a good church receives from those who have gone before it, from the church that has lived before it, the treasures that, that church gives. One of those treasures is, is Matins. And so we want to pay attention to this. We want to learn about it. We want to be soaked in it. Uh, because if we think that we can sort of be cowboy believers out on the range by ourselves, we are very, very foolish. Uh, the devil is like a wolf, more than happy to separate you from the pack and, and make you a lone ranger if he can, because they're the easiest ones for him to get. And instead, we know that wisdom, as our Lord himself says, is in holding fast to Christ as we also hold fast to the church. He sends out the apostles two by two, he says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He says to the apostles in the book of Hebrews, let us not neglect gathering together as is the habit of some, but let us gather together all the more as we come closer and closer to the last day. Uh, when he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. That's not something for you to think about. That's something for you to do. This do in remembrance of me. How do you remember Jesus? This do, that's how it says it in the Greek. Not do this, but this do. This is what you do in remembrance of me. Because if you really want to remember Jesus, if you really want to know who Jesus is, you must know him as the one who donates his flesh for you. You must know him as the one who donates his blood for you. You must know him as the self-giver, the self-donation of God. And that happens supremely in the Holy Supper. And it 
ties you to the cross, to the resurrection, to the future, to Jesus, to church, to his saints, to all, the, all good things. You will not know him apart from that. A good church has a supper. A good church listens to the church of the past. A good church preaches the word of God in keeping with the scriptures, which we have also been given. Most important thing we can do. So glad you're here. Invite others to join you. Tell folks about this broadcast. Tell them about the good things that are happening here. And, uh, and thanks be to God they are. So that people may have the most important thing they can have, which is a good church. Okay. So because the most important thing you can have is Jesus, you're not going to have that. You just aren't going to have that without a good church. He, he says it, you know. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, we are saved by Jesus alone. Jesus is never alone. Jesus comes with his saints attached, the body of Christ. So we're talking about Canticle, uh, in particular the Te Deum on page 223. Uh, I have to apologize again. Well, not really apologize, but last week I want to just acknowledge that I, I had to cut this short because an emergency phone call came in and that turned out okay, but um, turned out good for the kingdom um, and good for the folks uh, there who who wanted and needed Jesus um, and we'll, we'll hope to get through a whole broadcast here. So we were talking in particular about the music of the Te Deum and the music of the setting. This is sort of a more of a plain song chant sort of setting. Uh, this is it's eminently accessible to people. Uh, you know, you you really just have to kind of learn to hold notes with slight variations, right? And so we notice, look at page 225 and, and the end there. Um, Make them to be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. I mean, you just, you just, you're kind of holding on a note with slight variations. It's, it's easier to sing than some hymns today. So it's a beautiful setting. And these kinds of settings have been in the wheelhouse of the church and of the Western culture for centuries. And famous composers have been inspired by this music. I do want to say a comment, not too much. I do want to just mention on page 226, in addition to the Te Deum, which we've been using, we can use the Benedictus. Let me read the Benedictus and talk about where that comes from. Now, maybe we'll be starting to use that a little bit more as well. Um, because actually the Benedictus is probably the canticle most commonly used for morning prayer, even though we've been using the Te Deum, and I'll explain that in a moment. So this comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 60, 68 through 79. This is the canticle spoken or sung or chanted. I, mean, I don't know how you present it. I think he said it. But, you know, in the ancient world, saying something could mean chanting. Um, but it is Zechariah. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And this is what he spoke when his mouth was finally loosened at the birth of John. You may recall that when Zechariah was told that his wife would become pregnant, John uh, Zechariah questioned how that would happen, and Gabriel Gabriel responded. This I think I think this is the funniest part in scripture. I think it's the funniest scene. Gabriel responds by saying, "I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Why are you questioning me, man?" And and so then Zechariah is struck speechless for the duration of of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy. And uh, there's maybe some comments there to be made about, about marriage and uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and the fact that, you know, the, the pregnancy happened there after Zechariah couldn't talk anymore. Uh, sometimes, you know, actions are more important than words. But uh, in whatever the case, you know, it's all, in the, it's all the act of God. It's all the strength of God. So it's just, it's a great scene. And then what's really interesting too is that when Gabriel goes to St. Mary to tell her she, should, she will bear the Christ, she questions it. We always, have, you know, if you listen to a lot of church talk, it's like, oh, pure Mary, you know, she accepted humbly. She did after she questioned it, like Zechariah. And Gabriel does not say to Mary, I'm Gabriel, I'm from God. What is your problem? And strike her silent. He responds to her very much more gently and says, well, you know, nothing with God, nothing is impossible. 
So in Zechariah, the father of the last prophet, Gabriel speaks by way of the law, with St. Mary, by way of the gospel. Uh, he speaks promise and blessing because she's going to be the mother of the Christ, the Savior. It's really, really interesting to me. But anyway, um, the Benedictus is what he says, and so I'll read that here for you. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, my child, we call the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God. When the day shall dawn upon us from on high, oh, I got messed up there. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, when the day shall dawn upon us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then the glory of Patri, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The tone, the tune here is a little bit different. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. It's very beautiful, uh, very mellow, kind of a nice way to gently wake up the morning. And probably this was chosen as a morning canticle because of its reference to the dawn from on high coming and shining upon us, the day of grace, and preparing the way for Christ, or preparing the day for Christ, etc., etc. Um, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. What a great way to, to speak upon rising. So this was spoken after, traditionally in the, in the sort of monastic services of the church, the the full complement of hours throughout the day. This would be read at the service called Lauds, uh, morning service. And then when Lutherans developed Latin, when the church, including Lutherans, developed Matins, it became part of the Matin service, Lauds, and Prime and Matins were kind of combined there. Uh, this is actually the canticle that is appointed to be spoken on most simple days of the church year. And the Te Deum is appointed more for festival days and Sundays. So Sundays, a resurrection, a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord. Um, and then you have other festival days like Ascension happens on a Thursday. The presentation happens on February 2nd and Christmas on December 25th. Those are all movable feasts. And maybe even you'd have this for like if you celebrated St. Michael and All Angels on September 29th. So you would use Te Deum for that and then the Benedictus for most of the other typical sort of daily matins. Again, a beautiful setting, a beautiful text. And so I think we'll start using that here as well in addition to the Te Deum. And then that brings us to the prayers now, for the prayers, we, if you look at page 227 in, Mans, in the LSB, and you don't have to, if you don't have an LSB, it's okay, I'll just talk us through it. The prayers follow this pattern, the Kyrie, and it's actually a very shortened version of the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, sung like this, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And then, Our Father who art in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. 
And then there follow collects. Now, you can say, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, or you may also say, O Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Which is kind of nice for us because, you know, we're not gathered in person. We're here, we're in person, but there's this digital distance between us. And so it's kind of nice to have that option of simply saying, uh, O Lord, hear my prayer, or, yeah, uh, O Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come to you because... You know, to say the Lord be with you and you to say and also with you, it, I mean, it works, but we're not, we can't really hear each other or know each other is saying that and doing that. Um, you can hear me, I can't hear you. But we can sort of say together, oh Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. And then we have this beautiful collect. There's a, you, can, you read the collect of the day. The next thing you do is you read the collect of the day. So if it is a... A festival day, you read like the collect, the prayer for Ascension or Christmas or whatever, or Sunday. And then if it's a, if it's a sort of regular day following a Sunday, uh, the practice with which I'm familiar is that you read the collect or use the collect from the prior Sunday. And that becomes the collect of the day for each of the simple weekdays. Now, what is a collect? Why do we call it a collect? A collect is simply a prayer of the day that collects together the themes of the day collects together the people who are gathered in worship and in that collection of people and scripture and themes offers it all up to God. That's why it's called the collect. And after we have the collect of the day, then there's other collects in which we collect the needs of the community and offer those to God, complete with the collect for grace. Let me read that to you. This is a very old prayer coming from around the 300s. There were two different prayers I believe there are two different prayers written by St. Basil, uh, who was a Greek father in the 300s AD, so we're talking 1700 years ago, and they, those two prayers were fashioned into this collect for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. When I say that those, that's a, you know, a collection, a gathering of two prayers from St. Basil uh, and that were then worked together, they were worked together by the 700s because we, this comes to us from what's called the, uh, I've heard it pronounced both Galatian or Gelasian, sacramentary, essentially a book of prayers and liturgy that was used in the, by, in the church and that comes to us from, generally speaking, the region of, of France from the 700s AD. And it's old. And so again, this is a thousand, this is a, a 1300-year-old form of a prayer with roots even older than that. We're very, very blessed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, he's not here and I'm doing a live stream right now. Sorry about that. And so, um, he's not here right now. I'm not. I'm doing a live stream right now on Facebook. Okay. So, um, sorry about that. So, so this is really, it's ancient. It's, it, this, is, this is a church speaking through us. This also touches on another subject that comes up now and then. You know, when we do baptisms... Uh, we have this curious thing where the pastor will turn to the family and we will say, and there's the family holding the baby, getting baptized, right? And we say to the family, how are you named? <laughs> and of course the baby's like, mm -hmm. and so the family goes, you know, whatever the name is, um, Taylor Tyson or whatever. And, uh, and then when we come to the time of the baptism, we, we turn to the baby and say, do you believe in God, the father almighty? And again, the baby's like, and the family goes, yes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And people will look at that and they're like, well, the baby doesn't really believe any of that. The baby doesn't know any of that. And this is really, it's, an inter it's interesting that we respond this way. I mean, this is a way that the church did not think. This is something about which the church did not worry for centuries. This is, a, to make it more specific, this is a way that the church, when the church knew scripture probably even better than we know it, didn't think or, or worry about, something they didn't worry about. Why not? 
Well, because, and, and this, is, this is something that I find to be one of the most helpful teachings and doctrines of the Lutheran Church, if not the most challenging, uh, we believe in being, you know, we are saved by faith. Faith is a work of God. And that we believe as the scriptures speak. And we believe the scriptures speak very clearly that infant faith is not only possible, but infant faith is in fact normative for the Christian believer. How can that be? See, we have become so rational and we have come to identify faith so much with the, with the intellectual, to be very specific, with our intellectual engagement of speech and words. We have come to understand faith to be the intellectual engagement of speech and words, not just an intellectual matter of thoughts, but a specific kind of thought the engagement with speech and words that we we just don't think in our rational modernity don't think children are capable of that but scripture speaks otherwise because who was the first to hail christ on earth the answer is john the baptist before he was born john the baptist while he was still in the womb leapt for joy now you know it's not that, yes, it's that God causes him to leap for joy, but nevertheless, it is he who leaps for joy. And it is therefore an act of faith on behalf of the unborn John the Baptist. And we just spend months talking about that event alone. It's so wondrous and what it means for our life and for our common life and our social life. But that's the beginning of realizing that infants may have faith. And that uh, we see this confirmed in other places when Christ takes infant into his lap and blesses the infant. Well, we know that Christ's touch and Christ's words have no effect where they are not believed, right? We know that's the case because we're told he could do no power in certain places because he, there was no faith in him there. So if our Lord takes infants into his lap and blesses them and touches them, then we know that our Lord is saying to us, this infant may have faith. And so then, then, then we come to baptism, and then we say, well, then why is it that we actually baptize people? We baptize people not because people have faith. As Martin Luther would point out, you tell me you have faith, I don't know what your heart really is going on in your heart. You say you have faith, maybe you don't even know what's going on in your heart. But real faith simply says, Christ gave baptism, he gave it for infants because he says it's for all nations. All nations include infants. Infants can have faith in scripture, so we'll baptize infants. In obedience to what Christ gives and what Christ says, not in obedience to our own thought and logic. Not in obedience to our own reason, which Martin Luther once rather mm, earthly uh, called a, I will, turn, I, I will use the term lady of the night. He used it much more earthy term uh, for reason, but he called reason a lady of the night. And the reason why he says reason is a lady of the night is not because he hated reason, because he knew that our Lord was compassionate towards people, women like Mary Magdalene, you know, and restored people from, from that. And that's not, his, point, his point was reason will cling to any, any, any kind of reason, any just as the lady of the night will cling to any man, so will reason cling to any thought and any word. That is, reason can make hay out of anything. And so the, the question is not, are you using your reason? The question is what, is, what is using your reason? Is the word of God using your reason? And so, um, you know, reason teaches us, or not reason, scripture teaches our reason. Scripture schools our reason to see that even in infants, faith is a possibility. If faith is not what we think it is. We believe in faith as much as we understand faith. And, and believing in faith, we seek to understand it. So then that brings us back to the rite of baptism. It is getting back to Matins in a bit here. But people say, well, in you know, baptism, how come you answer for the baby? And how can you do that and call that a real baptism? Well, because the church is always answering for us. None of us have a word the church hasn't given us. The church always speaks for us. Because remember, we're told in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us 
with sighs too deep for words. We do not know how we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And one way in which the Holy Spirit speaks on earth, well, really the only way he speaks on earth, is through the church, through the various voices of the church. And so the church, when we speak at church, we are speaking for all Christians. When we speak at church, we are speaking for all believers. And our voice uh, stands in for all believers, even as Christ stands in for all sinners on the cross, right? And so we may answer for one another. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so, as someone once famously said, we baptize infants as though they're adults. We baptize adults as though they're infants. And then that brings us back to Matins and to why we use a service like Matins. This is the church speaking for us. This is the church speaking through us. This is us speaking with the church when we use a service like Matins. And thus also we have uh, the Holy Spirit blessing us profoundly by giving to us the voice that he himself has curated down through the ages in this beautiful collect for grace and in all the liturgy here that we use. Then we end with the Benedict Hamus, let us bless the Lord, thanks be to God. Someone once really, years and years and years ago, someone you, none of you even know, took real offense um, when she heard us say at church, let us bless the Lord. And she said, you can't bless the Lord. The Lord blesses us. What arrogance for you to think that you can bless the Lord. This is horrible. Ah, you know, it was a whole thing. But, you know, and, and God bless people for wanting to know the truth. Uh, God bless people even more for wanting to know the truth without making it a whole burden for everyone else. The simple answer is that when we say, let us bless the Lord, we are acknowledging what the word bless really means. Bless in scripture comes from the word eulogia, which simply means good word. So when the Lord blesses you, he's speaking a good word on you. When we bless the Lord, we speak a good word on the Lord. And so the pastor says, let us bless the Lord. And then the people give the best word they've got to speak on God. Thanks be to God. Because what does God say in Psalm 50? But that he does not want our sacrifices, but he wants our sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thanks be to God, the best word we have to speak on the Lord, word that he himself has given us through the scriptures and through his son. And then we conclude with another scriptural word, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is a actually a concluding benediction or blessing, eulogia, good word, that St. Paul gives to the Corinthians at the end of one of his letters. And now it's passed into specifically Lutheran usage, I think. I, I don't think that was originally used in the larger church Catholic before the Reformation. I think that it's in the Reformation and either Lutherans or Anglicans started using that particular benediction. I Maybe mean, it was the Anglicans in the Book of Common Prayer. I'm not sure. Started using that particular word as a benediction for the end of a service. And so there is development, but it's a scriptural development. It's sort of like in the Sunday morning service, uh, we typically sing the Gloria. Glory be to... Yeah, I think it was telling Wren. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. And then we all go, Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. We sing the Gloria. We just, there's another setting, which we're actually using our setting right now. We just started using it. Well, anyway... Sometimes we sing, This is the feast of victory for our God, Alleluia. And then we sing what's called the Dignus Est, Worthy is Christ. And that's relatively new, actually. Uh, that didn't appear until, I kind of want to say 1978, with the LBW, the Lutheran Book of Worship, the green one. And yet, it's, a, it's simply a canticle from Scripture. And so there's something good about using that. And, and it's kind of caught on, you know? And I, I have a feeling that will be another one of the contributions of the Lutheran Church that may stick. Uh, Lutheran Church has made a few developments to the liturgy that are unique to the Lutheran tradition. One, 
a lot of people don't realize, there are several we could point out. For example, the, the piety towards the crucifix that you now see in Roman Catholic churches today. That ultimately was something fostered by the Lutheran Reformation, because in the Lutheran Reformation, that image of the crucifix became so much foremost a matter of church architecture as opposed to images of the saints. And so then what happened eventually is Roman Catholics saw that and they said, you know, we kind of like that too. And then that became a focus in the Roman Catholic Church, piety towards Holy Communion. Uh, you know, people did not take Holy Communion as much by the time of the Reformation. It was Lutherans who said, take Holy Communion, take Holy Communion, come, it's for you, come and take that, take it frequently. That Eucharistic piety was a contribution of Lutheranism. Moving something as small as moving, oh, well, Advent calendar, uh, Advent wreaths. Advent wreaths were popularized by Lutherans. Now you see them in almost every church, including Roman Catholic and Protestant alike. Moving transfiguration from August 6th, I think, is where it used to be celebrated as a movable feast, to the last Sunday of Epiphany. That was a Lutheran move, and I think a very salutary one. So there's a couple little different th little things, little conservative changes that Lutheranism has made to the liturgy. That would make a great study all by itself, and why the Lutheran Church did that, um, and just kind of shows that you know we're part of that mainstream uh, Church Catholic that we're still contributing to, and actually continue to reform today. We now see churches across the world using the language of the people as well as Latin. Lutherans did that. We, we popular, we, people were using the language of the people before the Reformation, but became even more so after the Reformation. And yet at the same time, Lutheran was retained in certain ways, or Latin was retained in certain ways. Um, you know, the, the emphasis on marriage uh, and family the, the, the great affirmation of marriage and family that we associate with Christianity, that came out of the Lutheran Reformation. Uh, and on and on we could go. So many good things. Anyway, so far, that's your middle. That's your word in the middle of the week. And there's a lot to be done today, of course. So the Lord's blessings to you and the Lord's peace be with you. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again. You never see me on Thursdays. The reason why you don't see me on Thursdays for the morning devotion is because I am teaching a Bible study at that time from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. It is a Bible study for men. And uh, all men are welcome to that Bible study. And that's why you always see Pastor Johnson when he goes and teaches it, which will be in some months now. Um, then you'll always see me. All right. Peace.